Cameron Smith, the Vice President and General Counsel at the Art Street Institute. Uh, many of you all are familiar with Art Street and the work we do. We're a think tank that focuses on free markets and real solutions. Uh, we're concerned at that juncture where public policy hits the real world. Today is no exception. Uh, we're excited that all of you are here. We have a great crowd. Um, and I think we're going to have a very informative conversation. With that, I'll introduce my colleague, Tom Struve. <clears throat> Thanks, Cameron. Thank you to the National Union Building for allowing us to use this great space. Thank you to the Lincoln Network and our Street Institute for co-hosting this exciting event. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the four esteemed speakers that we'll be having. Uh, in order, it'll be FCC Chairman Ajit Pai, FTC Acting Chairman Maureen Kohlhausen, FCC Commissioner Michael Riley, and FCC Commissioner Brendan Carr. They'll each be sharing their remarks at this special event about the future of internet freedom, and I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. So without further ado. Thank you, Tom, for that very kind introduction. Thanks to R Street and the Lincoln Network for hosting us. Thanks to all of you for coming here this afternoon. Thanks as well to my esteemed panelists here, the acting chair of the FTC, Maureen Olhausen, and commissioners Mike O'Reilly and Brendan Carr. The internet is the greatest free market innovation in history. It's allowed us to live, to play, to work, to learn, and to speak in ways that were inconceivable a generation ago. But it didn't have to be that way. Its success is due in part to regulatory restraint. Democrats and Republicans decided in the 1990s that this new digital world wouldn't be centrally planned like a slow-moving 1930s utility. Instead, they chose internet freedom. And the results speak for themselves. Now, much has been said and written over the course of the past week about the plan to restore internet freedom. But much of that discussion has brought more heat than light. And so this afternoon, I'd like to cut through the hysteria and hot air and speak with you in plain terms about the plan. First, I'll explain what it will do. Second, I'll discuss why I am advancing it. And third, I'll respond to some of the main criticisms that have been leveled against it. At first, what will the plan do? Well, when you cut through the legal terms and technical jargon, it's very simple. The plan to restore internet freedom will bring back the same legal framework that was governing the internet three years ago today, and that has governed the internet for most of its existence. Let me repeat this point. The plan will bring back the same rules that govern the internet for most of its existence. Now, if you've been reading some of the media coverage about the plan, this might be news to you. After all, returning to the legal framework for internet regulation that was in place three years ago doesn't sound like destroying the internet or ending the internet as we know it. And it certainly isn't good clickbait. But facts are stubborn things. And here are some of those facts. Until 2015, the FCC treated high-speed internet access as a lightly regulated information service under Title I of the Communications Act. A few years ago, the Obama administration instructed the FCC to change course. And the FCC did. On a party-line vote in 2015, it classified internet access as a heavily regulated telecommunications service under Title II of the Communications Act. If the plan is adopted on December 14, we will simply reverse the FCC's 2015 decision and go back to the pre-2015 Title I framework. Now, I'm sure some of you out there are still thinking that there must be more to this. And I'll confess that once the plan to restore internet freedom is adopted, one thing will be different compared to three years ago. Consumers will be empowered by getting more information from internet service providers or ISPs. My internet service provider transparency rule will be stronger than it was in 2014. So that is the what. Next, why. Why am I proposing to return to the pre-2015 regulatory framework? Well, the most important reason is that it was an overwhelming success. We think back to what the internet looked like in 1996. Email was still the killer app. AOL was the most visited website. And the top 20 sites included the home pages for four universities, Carnegie Mellon, 
Illinois, Michigan, and MIT. Forget about YouTube. Simply downloading a static web page took about 30 seconds, and you paid by the hour for access. And being online also tied up your phone line. So, how did we get from there to here? And as I said at the outset, a huge part of it was the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And as part of this landmark law, President Clinton and a Republican Congress agreed that it would be the policy of the United States to preserve, as it, to quote, the vibrant and competitive free market presently exists for the internet, unfettered by federal and state regulation. They deliberately rejected thinking of the internet as Ma Bell, or a water company, or a subway system. And encouraged by light touch regulation, the private sector responded. It invested over $1.5 trillion to build out wired and wireless networks throughout the United States. 28.8K modems eventually gave way to gigabit fiber connections. US innovators and entrepreneurs used this open platform to start companies that have become global giants. Indeed, the five biggest companies in America today by market capitalization are internet companies. And that's no accident. America's internet economy became the envy of the world. And the fact that the largest technology companies of the digital economy are homegrown has given us a key competitive advantage. But then, in early 2015, the FCC chose a decidedly different course for the internet. Again, at the urging of the Obama administration, the FCC scrapped the tried and true light touch regulation of the internet and replaced it with heavy handed micromanagement. And it did this despite the fact that the internet wasn't broken in 2015. There was no market failure that justified the regulatory sledgehammer of Title II. But no matter, these 21st century networks would now be regulated under creaky rules that were the hot new thing back in the 1930s during the Roosevelt administration. And the results have been bad for consumers. The first negative consumer impact is less infrastructure investment. The top complaints consumers have about the internet is not and has never been that their ISP is doing things like blocking content. It's that they don't have enough access and competition. And ironically, Title II has made that concern even worse by reducing investment in building and maintaining high-speed networks. In the two years of the Title II era, broadband network investment declined by $3.6 billion, or more than 5%. And notably, this is the first time that such investment has declined outside of a recession in the internet era. And of course, when there's less investment, that means fewer next generation networks are built, that means fewer jobs for Americans building those networks, and it means more Americans who are left on the wrong side of what I call the digital divide. Now, this impact has been particularly serious for smaller internet service providers. They don't have the time, or the money, or the lawyers to navigate a thicket of complex rules. And I have personally visited some of them, from Spencer Municipal Utilities in Spencer, Iowa, to Wave Wireless in my hometown of Parsons, Kansas. And so it is no surprise that the Wireless Internet Service Providers Association, which represents small fixed wireless companies that typically operate in rural America, surveyed its members and found that over 80% quote, incurred additional expense in complying with the Title II rules, had delayed or reduced network expansion, had delayed or reduced services, and had an allocated budget to comply with the rules. And other small companies too have told the FCC that these regulations have forced them to cancel, to delay, or to curtail fiber network upgrades. And nearly two dozen small providers submitted a letter saying that the FCC's heavy-handed rules, quote, affect our ability to find financing. And that is what makes these Title II regulations so misplaced. However well-intentioned, they are hurting the very small providers and new entrants that are best positioned to bring additional competition to the marketplace. As I warned before the SEC went down this road in 2015, a regulatory structure designed for a monopoly will inevitably move the market in the direction of a monopoly. Now, turning away from investment, the second negative consumer impact from the FCC's heavy-handed regulations has been less innovation. We shifted from a wildly successful framework of permissionless innovation to a mother-may-I approach that has had a chilling effect. 
One major company, for instance, reported to the FCC that it put on hold a project to build out its out-of-home Wi-Fi network due to uncertainty about the FCC's regulatory stance. And a coalition of 19 municipal internet service providers, this is city-owned nonprofits, have told the FCC on the record that they, quote, often delay or hold off from rolling out a new feature or service because they cannot afford to deal with a potential complaint or enforcement action. Now ask yourself, how is this good for consumers? And much of the problem stems from the vague internet conduct standard that the Commission adopted in 2015, a standard that we are proposing to repeal. Under the standard, the FCC didn't say specifically what conduct was prohibited. Instead, it just gave itself a roving mandate to second-guess new service offerings, new features, and new business models. And understandably, businesses then sought clarity on how the standard would be applied. My predecessor's answer, and I quote, we don't know. We'll have to see where things go. My friends, that is the very definition of regulatory uncertainty. And well, where did things go after that? It is telling that the FCC's first target under the Internet Conduct Standard was consumer-friendly free data plans. Wireless companies are offering customers the option of enjoying services like streaming video or music exempt from any data limits. And these plans have proven really popular, especially among lower-income Americans. Yes, the FCC had met the enemy, and it was free data. It started a lengthy investigation of free data plans and would have cracked down on them had the presidential election of 2016 turned out differently. So that is what I'm proposing to do and why I'm proposing to do it. Next, I'd like to take on the main criticisms I have heard directed against the plan and separate fact from fiction, one claim at a time. And given that some of the more eye-catching critiques have come from Hollywood celebrities whose large online followings give them outsized influence in shaping the public debate, I thought I'd respond directly uh, to some of their assertions. And perhaps the most common criticism is that ending Title II utility-style regulation will mean the end of the internet as we know it. Or, as Kumail Nanjiani, the star of HBO's Silicon Valley, put it, we will never go back to a free internet. But here's the simple truth. We had a free and open internet for two decades before 2015, and we will have a free and open internet going forward. Many critics don't seem to understand or want to understand that we are moving from heavy-handed regulation to light-touch regulation, not no regulation. We are not taking a completely hands-off approach. We aren't giving anybody a free pass. We are simply shifting from one-size-fits-all preemptive regulation to targeted enforcement that focuses uh, enforcement action on actual market failure or any competitive conduct. For example, the plan would restore the ability and the authority of the Federal Trade Commission, America's premier consumer protection agency, to police the practices of internet service providers. If companies engage in unfair or deceptive or any competitive practices, the Federal Trade Commission would be able to take action. And this framework for protecting a free and open internet worked well in the past, and I submit that it will work well again. And Chairman Olhausen will soon offer further details. Now, the plan would also empower the Federal Trade Commission to once again police broadband providers' privacy and data security practices. In 2015, the FCC stripped the Federal Trade Commission of authority to do this. But the plan would put the nation's most experienced privacy cop back on the beat. And that should be a welcome development for every American who cares about his or her privacy. Now another concern I've heard is that the plan will harm rural and low-income Americans. Cher, for example, has tweeted that the internet will include less Americans, not more, the majority of that in all caps, if my proposal was adopted. But the opposite is true. The digital divide is all too real. And I've spent numerous visits and over 4,000 road miles on the road myself seeing it firsthand. Too many rural and low-income Americans are still unable to get high-speed internet access. But heavy-handed Title II regulation makes that problem worse. They reduce investment in broadband networks, especially in rural and low-income areas. And so, by turning back time, so to speak, 
and returning internet regulation to the pre-2015 era, we will expand broadband networks and bring high-speed access to more Americans, not fewer. Then there is this critique that was offered by Mark Ruffalo, and I quote, Taking away net neutrality is the authoritarian dream, consolidating information in the hands of a few controlled by a few. Dangerous territory. Now, I'll confess that when I saw this tweet, I was tempted to just say, Hulk, wrong, and just simply move on. And I've seen similar points made elsewhere, including in one email asking, do you really want to be the man who is responsible for making America another North Korea? <laughs> These comments are utterly absurd. Getting rid of government authority over the internet is the exact opposite of authoritarianism. Government control is the defining feature of authoritarians, including the one in North Korea. Now, another common criticism is that after the plan is adopted, the internet will become like cable television, and Americans will have to pay more to reach certain groups of websites. George Takai of Star Trek fame recently tweeted an article claiming that this was happening in Portugal, which doesn't have net neutrality, and that this would happen in the United States if the plan were adopted. Just a few little problems with this. For one thing, the Obama administration itself made clear that curated internet packages are lawful in the United States under the FCC's 2015 rules. Let me say that again. The conduct that is described in a graphic that is currently being spread around the internet is currently allowed under the previous administration's Title II rules. And so, for example, if broadband providers want to offer a $10 a month package where you could only access a few websites like Twitter and Facebook, they can do that today. Indeed, the DC Circuit Court of Appeals recently pointed out that net neutrality rules don't prohibit these curated offerings. And so the complaints by Mr. Dukai and others doesn't hold water. They're arguing that if the plan that were adopted Internet service providers would suddenly start doing something that net neutrality rules already allow them to do. But the reason why ISPs aren't offering those packages now and likely won't offer those packages in the future is that American consumers simply don't want them, by and large. An additional problem with that graphic, as several fact checkers have pointed out, Portugal is part of the European Union, which does have net neutrality regulations. And moreover, the graphic relates to supplemental data plans featuring specific apps that the customers could get from one provider, beyond the various unrestricted base plans that provider offered. As one fact-checking report put it, this example, quote, is pointing to an example that has nothing to do with net neutrality. Other than that, <laughs> uh, now shifting gears, uh, Alyssa Milano tweeted, quote, <laughs> We've faced a lot of issues threatening our democracy in the last year. But honestly, the FCC and Adagee Pi FCC's dismantling of net neutrality is one of the biggest. I'm threatening our democracy? Really? I'd like to see the evidence that America's democratic institutions were threatened by the Title I framework that persisted from the Clinton administration, through the Bush administration, through the first six years of the Obama administration. Don't hold your breath, because there is none. And I dare say that if this were who's the boss, this would be a right opportunity for Tony Danza to dish out some wisdom about the consequences of making things up. <laughs> this reminds me of another point, and one that has been brought home to me the past few days. This debate needs, and our culture needs, a more informed discussion about public policy on this and many other issues. We need quality information, not hysteria, because hysteria takes us to unpleasant, if not dangerous, places. We can disagree on policy. That is the American way. We shouldn't demonize, especially when all of us share the same goal of a free and open internet. Anyway, the criticism of this plan, of course, comes from more than just Hollywood. I'm also well aware that some in Silicon Valley have criticized it. Twitter, for example, has said that it strongly opposes the plan and, quote, will continue to fight for an open internet which is indispensable to free expression, consumer choice, and innovation. Now, look, I love Twitter. I was the first FCC commissioner on Twitter, and anyone who knows me knows that I use it all the time. 
But let's not kid ourselves. When it comes to a free and open internet, Twitter is part of the problem. The company has a viewpoint and uses that viewpoint to discriminate. Just one of many examples, two months ago, Twitter blocked Representative Marsha Blackburn from advertising her Senate campaign launch video because it featured a pro-life message. Before that, during the so-called Day of Action, Twitter warned users that a link to a statement by one company on the topic of internet regulation may be unsafe. And to say the least, the company appears to have a double standard when it comes to suspending or de-verifying conservative users' accounts as opposed to those of liberal users. This conduct is many things, but it isn't fighting for an open internet. And unfortunately, Twitter is not an outlier. Indeed, despite all the talk and all the fear that broadband providers could decide what internet contents consumers can see, recent experience shows that so-called edge providers are in fact deciding what content they see. These providers routinely block or discriminate against content they don't like. The examples from the past year alone are legion. App stores barring the doors to apps from even cigar aficionados because they are perceived to be pro-tobacco use. Really. Streaming services restricting videos from the likes of conservative commentator Dennis Prager on subjects that he considers important to understanding American values. Algorithms that decide what content you see or don't, but aren't disclosed themselves. Online platforms secretly editing users' comments. And of course, American companies caving to repressive foreign governments' demands to block certain speech, conduct that would be repugnant to free expression if it occurred within our borders. And in this way, edge providers are a much bigger actual threat to an open internet than broadband providers, especially when it comes to discrimination on the basis of viewpoint. And that might explain why the CEO of a company called Cloudflare recently questioned whether, quote, it is the right place for tech companies to be regulating the internet. He didn't offer a solution, but he did remark following up, quote, what I know is not the right answer is that a cabal of 10 tech executives with names like Matthew, Mark, Jack, Jeff, are the ones choosing what content goes online and what content doesn't go online. Notwithstanding these sentiments, these companies want to place much tougher regulations on broadband providers than they're willing to have placed upon themselves. So let's be clear. They might cloak their advocacy in the public interest, but the real interest of these internet giants is in using the regulatory process to cement their dominance in the internet economy. And here's the thing, I don't blame them for trying. But the government shouldn't aid and abet those efforts. We have no business picking winners or losers in any marketplace, particularly <laughs> one as dynamic as the internet marketplace. A level playing field, not regulatory arbitrage, is what best serves consumers and competition. So to wrap up, I'd like to quote from an article in the New York Times. Some experts say the government's planned withdrawal from internet management is the best way to bring marketplace efficiencies to the increasingly commercial global network. But pessimists worry that this critical part of the emerging electronic web could become a patchwork of private roads. Now, part of the parade of horribles mentioned in that quote and throughout the article were written back in 1994 about the decision to privatize the internet. So this debate is not new. But history has proven that policymakers made the right decision back in 1994 and the right decision in 1996 when they applied a light touch regulatory framework to the internet. And so when you get past all the wild accusations, the fear mongering, the hysteria, here's the frankly boring bottom line. The plan to restore internet freedom would return to the light touch market-based approach under which the internet thrived. That is why I'm asking my colleagues to vote for it on December 14th. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to hearing the comments from my colleagues.
afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you to R Street for hosting and to be here with Chairman Pye and Commissioners uh, O'Reilly and Carr, somewhere, somewhere out there. Um, and I'm very pleased, particularly, to be here today to talk about how the FCC's Restoring Internet Freedom Proposal revives and even enhances the FTC's ability to protect broadband consumers. So back in 2014, I warned that regulating broadband providers as Title II common carriers would create an enormous consumer protection gap, cutting out not just the FTC's active privacy enforcement, but also removing our ability to challenge any deceptive or unfair practices by broadband providers. And for consumer sake, I am therefore pleased that the proposed order would return to broadband consumers the FTC protections that they had before 2015. But what does this mean for net neutrality? Now, the term net neutrality today is an expansive, amorphous concept. It's commonly used to mean protecting consumers and internet companies from a variety of bad actions by broadband providers. In other words, net neutrality advocates are concerned about protecting consumers and promoting competition. Now, if those two goals sound familiar, it might be because Congress assigned those twin missions to the FTC. We have a long history of actively protecting consumers and promoting competition across a wide range of industries. This includes highly technical industries, such as microprocessors and pharmaceuticals, where we study the competitive dynamics of a complex industry to evaluate a company's practices. We've brought a multitude of cases against companies big and small, stopping any competitive behavior and saving consumers billions of dollars. We've re reviewed mergers involving ISPs <coughs> and online content, such as AOL Time Warner, and brought consumer protection cases against companies like Apple, AT&T, Dish, Facebook, Google, T-Mobile, and many others. Indeed, the FTC closely watched the behavior of the early on-ramps to the internet and brought cases against AOL, CompuServe, Juno, and Prodigy for deceiving consumers about their services. And we have an ongoing case against AT&T Mobility for allegedly unfairly and deceptively throttling broadband speeds on unlimited wireless data plans. And wireless provider track phones settled with us for similar behavior. The FTC is also the primary enforcer of online consumer privacy and data security. In fact, I was at the FTC when we brought the first online privacy case against GeoCities in 1998. The FTC has brought more than 500 privacy and security related enforcement actions and held more than 20 workshops and events on privacy and data security topics. And that leadership continues. Just this morning, we released the agenda for our December 12th Informational Injury Workshop, where we will examine the types of harm from the exposure or misuse of consumers' personal information, including harms from stalking and discrimination. And as a related aside, I've been dismayed that some who feel passionately about net neutrality have been willing to invade the privacy of officials with whom they disagree. But back to the FTC. The FTC's ability to protect consumers and promote competition in the broadband industry isn't something new or far-fetched. We have a long-established role in preserving the values that consumers care about online, including the consumer protection and competition issues that concern net neutrality advocates. In fact, 10 years ago, a bipartisan FTC report analyzed net neutrality concerns and cautioned against prescriptive regulation. The report's legal and economic analysis concluded that banning certain business models could harm consumers more than it helps them. Many such arrangements could actually benefit broadband consumers, saving them money and prioritizing services they care about. And, the report noted, the FTC can assess whether broadband ISPs practices are anti-competitive, unfair, or deceptive on a case-by-case -case basis. Indeed, the FTC has regularly addressed the kinds of anti-competitive behaviors that concern net neutrality advocates. For example, the FTC has sued companies for foreclosing rival content in an exclusionary or predatory manner, 
We've challenged problematic access, discrimination, pricing, and bundling practices. And we've conditioned vertical mergers that would have foreclosed competition in a downstream market. Antitrust enforcement protects the competitive process and therefore can promote net neutrality if that is what consumers want. Now, advocates of net neutrality regulation often argue that consumers value the equal treatment of data by broadband ISPs. If so, then expect a public backlash against any ISP that degrades applications or limits access to content that its subscribers demand. On the other hand, consumers may desire and benefit from arguably non-neutral practices, such as streaming service bundles, money-saving free data programs, or prioritization of telemedicine services. So although the 2015 FCC rules purported, purported to be about consumer choice, they likely limited the options available to consumers. And this point is worth emphasizing. In the marketplace, companies seek to deliver what consumers want. But under prescriptive regulation, companies seek to deliver what regulators want. Case by case, antitrust enforcement focused on competitive harm will allow ISPs, edge providers, and content providers to all experiment with innovative business models that will face the ultimate marketplace test, whether they benefit consumers. Like our antitrust tools, the FTC's Consumer Protection Authority can address concerns that consumers are not getting what they expect from their ISP. Our Deception Authority bans companies from offering consumers one product or service or providing them something different. Notably, our 2007 bipartisan report recommended that <coughs> ISPs clearly disclose the material terms of broadband internet access, particularly any traffic shaping practices. Thus, I'm very pleased to see that Chairman Pai's proposed order adopts vigorous transparency requirements. Under the order, ISPs must disclose a wide range of practices, including blocking, throttling, or prioritization. ISPs won't be able to hide their practices. Consumers will know what they're getting up front. And if an ISP's practices deviate from their disclosures, or if they fail to disclose important information, the FTC can sue them. Also, the FTC can stop unfair practices, even when there is no deception. Indeed, as I previously mentioned, the FTC is currently challenging as unfair and deceptive AT&T Mobility's alleged practice of throttling unlimited wireless data plans. Now, some criticize the FTC's enforcement-based approach. But as our 2007 bipartisan report concluded, case-by-case -case enforcement is the best tool for the types of practices that often benefit consumers, but might harm consumers in certain instances. And this approach allows beneficial practices while curbing the use. By contrast, per se prohibitions, the inflexible approach taken by the FCC in 2015, prevent beneficial practices. And because rules don't enforce themselves, <coughs> government would still have to bring specific <coughs> cases to address any abuses. So in short, the FTC has tools that are capable of protecting consumers and competition online. We've done so across the economy, throughout the internet, and until 2015, we did so for broadband consumers as well. Yet in the last week, I've read a lot of, a lot of anxious theorizing over the future of the internet. But the internet was a success long before the 2015 regulations. And the FCC's repeal of those regulations doesn't mean that neutral practices will disappear. Indeed, where consumers desire neutrality, they'll get it through market competition, facilitated by the FCC's transparency rules, and by antitrust and consumer protection law, enforced by the FTC, the Department of Justice, state attorneys general, and private plaintiffs. And companies across the entire internet ecosystem will remain free to experiment with innovative business models that benefit consumers. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing the other stuff. Well, thank you, everybody. Mr. Chairman and Chairwoman, I appreciate your comments. I'm going to add mine to the 
the list. It is so great to be here, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to express my views and strong support for the actions the Commission will take in a few short weeks. After a painful and demoralizing 2015 decision to insert government regulation into the middle of the greatest man-made invention of our time, I was never quite sure that this day would come. Two years ago, the light of internet freedom was nearly extinguished when the prior Commission majority mistakenly thought it was their duty to enact unnecessary and harmful edicts for the purpose of imposing their will over that of innovators, users, internet businesses, small and large. They thought that the election of the previous president sanctioned the enactment of a latest rule over the internet. They thought the internet would only succeed if they created a near omnipotent, unaccountable enforcement regime that control internet practices, declaring winners and losers like a drunk 1920s New York cop on the V. They thought that paid prioritization practices of which they demonstrated no understanding or knowledge must be completely banned despite whatever benefits could possibly be delivered to consumers. They thought a few questionable instances from more than a decade prior could gloss over the fact that these are always prophylactic rules grasping about for a purpose and an imaginary boogeyman. And they thought they could treat broadband providers like a public utility and all of their mother may I style regulations would have no effect on investment or broadband buildup. And they counted on that no commission would ever have the gumption to undo their prior bad deeds. But they thought wrong. We join today to signal the efforts of this new commission, led by our able chairman, to chart a different course for broadband and the internet. It is one that looks a lot like that of the highly successful, bipartisan governmental approach that existed prior to the imposition of the destructive Title II regime. And it's based on the free market principles that are the core of the American economy and our democracy. Under this commission, we will let facts prevail over hyperbole and get the internet regulatory structure back on the right course. First and foremost, it's important to dispel the notion that the FCC needs to save any neutrality else our freedom on the internet will be put in jeopardy. That is pure hogwash. The Commission had no net neutrality rules prior to December 2010. That unregulated <coughs> regime resulted in the creation of Google in 1998, Facebook in 2004, YouTube in 2005, and Twitter in 2006. Net neutrality supporters suggest we need rules to protect the next Google, the next Facebook. But no one can point to a single harm that prevented the first 1.0 version of these companies. Indeed, the facts support the notion that the internet flourished without any rules. There is also no concrete harm or evidence of network or consumer harm. Just recently, I sat down with one prominent internet legend and pioneer, who also happens to be a net neutrality supporter, and asked him why we needed rules, and what supposed harms that the agency needed to remedy. Here, I was mentally preparing for an intense dialogue full of technical intricacies that would test my understanding of network management and so forth. Instead, the response was non substantive and sadly typical. He stated, Once upon a time, a large cable company tried to break the internet. The instance alluded to was not actually a violation, and that's the best example anyone has come up with all this time. Perhaps because of a lack of actual violations, supporters resort to dreaming up potential new violations that could supposedly occur absent government intervention. They argue that without these rules, broadband providers will block, throttle, or charge fees for individual users, small businesses, or startups who express certain views or try to compete against them. For these fears to materialize, you would have to assume a couple things. One, companies who have promised not to engage in such behavior, which are subject to enforceable actions by the FTC, would do so anyways. And two, consumers and advocates who scrutinize every action of these companies for the slightest missteps would somehow miss what was happening. This is complete lunacy. In an area like net neutrality, where the stakes are so high, the risk is far too great and any reward too paltry for a company to engage in such practices. At the same time, we must not only halt the imposition of these net neutrality rules to broadband companies, but also prevent its spread to the rest of the internet ecosystem. It is incredible how far a bad idea can travel on the back of a foolish slogan. In 2014, I warn that eventually FCC meddling and persistent mission creep meant that the wrath of government regulations could be coming for edge providers next. At the time, I was criticized for sensationalizing the matter. Many policymakers and the edge community 
had convinced themselves that there was some magical red line that would never be crossed. Yet, just this year, we have seen the previously untouchable sector of the internet economy come under criticism and their business practices subjected to oversight and scrutiny with demands that these companies must also be saddled with net neutrality. Indeed, one senator just recently called for edge providers to be subject to net neutrality standards, stating that Facebook, Google, and Amazon, like ISPs, should be neutral in their treatment of the flow of lawful information and commerce on their platforms. And similar calls for broad regulations will continue. Absent our action to cut off the octopus's tentacles, net neutrality will continue to stretch to every portion and crevice on the internet. As we take this action, we must also include a thorough preemption analysis, setting forth the technical facts and legal basis for our exclusive federal jurisdiction over broadband. By doing so, we establish a uniform national framework that promotes investment and innovation. It is critically important to be explicit, as the draft order does, that the service is interesting, even though it may seem obvious. States and localities must be precluded from adopting a patchwork of regulations that would deter broadband investment by private businesses and undermine our own federal policies to facilitate deployment. Without this much needed clarity, the FCC and businesses would end up wasting valuable time and resources playing defense in state legislatures, public utility commissions, and the courts to stamp out inconsistent laws and regulations. Moreover, we have seen the damage that opportunistic state regulators can try to inflict when the FCC has refused to resolve questions of classification or jurisdiction. For more than a decade, the FCC engaged in regulatory contortionism to keep from having to classify the offering of internet applications such as VoIP. During that time, certain states have tried to take advantage of the FCC's hesitation and regulate the service themselves, attempting to impose fees and institute approval processes. We've also seen state legislators attempt to impose privacy requirements on all internet service providers after Congress rightfully decided that all that the FCC's ill-advised rules should be rescinded. In California, for example, legislation was put forward last session that would not only have restored the FCC's rules, but also would have barred voluntary arrangements where consumers obtain a discount from carriers for the use of their data. Now a ballot initiative picks up the place of this failed legislation and expands this broken thinking not just to ISPs, but to all businesses that collect and sell data for commercial purposes. And California is not alone, as 10 other states have taken steps this year to impose their own misguided privacy laws, creating uncertainty, inconsistency, and placing providers of an offering that freely crosses state and local boundaries in the untenable and costly position of trying to comply with a mishmash of rules even within our own national boundaries. I respect that our Constitution reserves certain powers to the states. But the regulation of interstate commerce is not one of them. While well, I do not believe that net neutrality rules are warranted or that the FCC has any legal authority to act such rules, ultimately that decision is not up to me or my fellow commissioners. This is a matter for our duly elected members of Congress acting on behalf of the American people to balance the competing ideas and interests and decide whether and to what extent rules are needed. In other words, the FCC should put things back the way they were and let Congress decide whether any further actions are justified. In closing, I will remind everyone that our job as commissioners is, with fidelity to the country, to follow the law and the accumulated record and make the best decision possible for the American people. However hotly charged the debate may be or the number of comments filed in the record, we're asked to make the best decision, which may not always be the most popular. Remind of a quote by World War II General George S. Patton, who stated, do your duty as you see it, and damn the consequences. In the coming weeks, I intend to do just that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to the Lincoln Network and R Street Institute for hosting this event and for inviting me to speak with you today. This is a great moment for consumers, for innovation, and for freedom. Last week, as you know, as he spoke here a few minutes ago, the FCC chairman circulated a proposal that will restore internet freedom by reversing the Obama-era FCC's unprecedented decision to apply Title II regulations to the internet. Reversing this 2015 decision, this massive regulatory overreach, 
has my full support. Prior to the FCC's 2015 decision, consumers and innovators alike benefited from a free and open internet. This was not because the government imposed heavy-handed utility-style regulation. This was not because the FCC had a rule in place that purported to regulate internet conduct. The FCC did none of that. Instead, the Republican and Democrat administrations alike, including through the first six years of the Obama administration, the FCC abided by a 20-year bipartisan consensus that the government should not control or heavily regulate internet access. The internet flourished under this framework. The private sector invested over 1.5 trillion in broadband networks. And every part of the internet economy benefited, from consumers to innovators to businesses of every size. Title II did not build that. Title II did not create the open internet. And Title II was not the way to maintain it. To the contrary, the FCC's Title I framework supported our country's internet success story. After a two-year detour, it's great to see the FCC returning to this proven regulatory approach. Now, there's no question that the debate over the future of internet freedom has generated significant public attention, as it should. Yet as you survey some of the news coverage out there, you'll no doubt see some scaremongering and a babble of misinformation. No, that Portuguese internet meme, as we've heard, is not true. No, the FCC is not changing the legality of bundled offerings or curated internet services. And no, and I've actually gotten this one on a number of occasions, which kind of surprised me, the FCC's Title II rules were not the key to Justin Bieber being discovered online. <laughs> The Beebs also flourished before the FCC's 2015 decision. These fear tactics, such as they are, are no match for the facts. Or to paraphrase Mark Twain, rumors of the internet's demise that we're reading about are greatly exaggerated. Here's the reality. The FCC will be voting to reverse a two-year-old decision and return to the same regulatory environment that governed the internet in 2015 and for the 20 years that preceded it. Does anyone remember living in the internet dark ages of 2015? Do you recall two years ago when you were unable to go online to post, to stream, to learn, to rally? Of course not. And that's the point. We know from our own experience that the Title I regulatory approach works. And we know from our own experience that Title II does not. As the proposed order explains, Title II has imposed significant costs. We've seen broadband deployment projects that could have brought new services to consumers put on hold. We've seen investment in broadband networks decline. And we've seen providers delay the introduction of new offerings. Reversing this failed experiment with heavy-handed internet regulation will put a tried and true framework back in place and it will power the deployment, investment, and innovation that will benefit American consumers for decades to come. At the same time, by returning to the Title I framework, the FCC is not relying on market forces or competition alone. The plan includes robust consumer protections. We've already heard about some of them today, and I'll highlight just four. First, when the FCC applied Title II regulations to the internet, that decision divested the Federal Trade Commission of 100% of its authority to protect consumers from any unfair or deceptive practice by an ISP. Reversing the Title II decision will restore the authority of the FTC, the nation's leading consumer protection agency. This will provide consumers with important safeguards that they do not have today. Second, the FTC, which is also the country's expert privacy enforcement agency, will once again be empowered to protect the personal information of broadband consumers. Since the FCC's Title II decision, the FTC has been prohibited from taking any action regarding the privacy or data security practices of ISPs. Reversing Title II will put the FTC back on the side of consumers rather than where it is right now, which is the sidelines. Third, federal antitrust laws will prevent ISPs from reaching agreements to unfairly block, throttle, 
or discriminate against internet content or traffic. And those laws will also make it illegal for a vertically integrated ISP to anti-competitively favor its content or services over that of an unaffiliated business. And fourth, state consumer protection laws will continue to provide safeguards against unfair ISP business practices, and state attorneys general will have the authority to bring legal action to enforce consumers' rights. Indeed, the FCC's proposed order contemplates that these authorities will continue to play a vital role in protecting consumers within the framework that the order lays out. The FCC's proposed order discusses additional consumer protections, and you can read about them for yourself. Because in a break from the last administration, the document was made available to the public more than three weeks before the FCC vote. In 2015, the public did not get to see the Title II decision until two weeks after the agency voted. So I encourage everyone to take the time to read it. Now before I wrap up, I want to look back to 2015 one more time. In October of that year, long before I became an FCC commissioner, I gave a speech at another telecom event where I talked about the FCC's then recent Title II decision. I closed that speech by saying this. I'm optimistic that the US will return to the successful, light touch approach to the internet that spurred massive investments in our broadband infrastructure. Efforts are underway in both the courts and Congress to reverse the FCC's decision. And following next year's presidential election, the composition of the FCC could be substantially different than it is today. Now, two years ago, I certainly did not imagine that I would be part of the FCC's new composition. But I'm very grateful for this opportunity to serve I'm grateful that my optimism back then has proven to be well-founded. I look forward to casting my vote on December 14th in favor of internet freedom. Thank you. I'll ask Commissioner O'Reilly to say a thank you for your leadership, especially uh, during difficult moments uh, and doing your duty. Uh, so with that, we are going to uh, thank the chairman and the commissioners uh, for being with us today. Uh, we're going to allow them to get back to their jobs, uh, and we will bring up our expert panel. Uh, so if the panel uh, can come take their chairs, uh, we will move forward with the conversation. My name is Garrett Johnson. I'm one of the founders of Lincoln Network. We are a community of technology professionals, uh, and we focus on advancing economic and individual liberty using our technology skills. And we are very honored to have a ter terrific panel uh, here today. I think all of them are taking their chairs now. So announcing them in, uh, in no specific order, we have Tom Strobel with the R Street Institute. We have Brent Skurup with the Marcatus Center. We have Rosalind Leighton with the American Enterprise Institute, uh, and we have Jessica Malusian with the uh, Competitive Enterprise Institute. Uh, there's a large crowd here uh, because of the importance of this topic, uh, but also in large part due to the important work uh, by our friends at the Arsery Institute, uh, and so we are honored uh, to co-host this event with them. Uh, so without further delay, Jessica, Jessica I will hand you this one.
expressed their dissent at that time. They wrote very wise dissents, which is very important to, uh, to present to the courts. And here they are in the position of, uh, you know, in the leadership positions. So I think we should just recognize all that they've been through to be able to write the order that they have. It's over 200 pages, over 1,000 footnotes. They have uh, covered all the bases. And, and so, and I think one of the key things they point out is the transparency. If we look back to 2014, we had the president dictating the terms to then FCC that had to result in this 400-page order, which we weren't able to see until they voted on. It's really a different world today. And I'm, I'm just delighted to, to see the change. What I think I want to leave with this audience, just a key point. There's a difference between net neutrality and internet freedom. Um, net neutrality is sort of like the taxi industry for telecommunications. A regulator decides how the rides work, they decide the color of the cabs, how it's priced, and they determine market entry and market exit. Internet freedom, on the other hand, is about permissionless innovation for networks. It is the ability for uh, consumers to be able to choose the kind of network and the way that they want to receive broadband and for them to express their preferences of how they want to, how they want to, how they want to do it. Not from the choice of regulators. I think that Commission, uh, Chairman Allhausen said it very well, that under a highly regulated regime, companies perform to the regulators' expectations, not to the consumers' expectations. So what's so encouraging about the, uh, the order in front of us is that consumers, once again, will have the ability to define broadband. And, and I'm delighted to see how things can evolve in the future. Yes, there's a song. Anybody else? <clears throat> right. Try to speak up. Um, so I, I just want to praise the commissioners who, who just spoke uh, for uh, the proposed rulemaking and the rescission of the Title II order a few years ago. It's not often that regulators voluntarily relinquish control, regulatory control. As to their credit, that they decided to relinquish this control of the internet. And I want to emphasize that the 2015 order was not run of the mill government overreach. This was an attempt to transform the agency into a very powerful internet regulation agency. And it would have changed the trajectory of the agency from the traditional various regulation. And there's a saying in DC if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And and what the commissioners are doing is saying to innovators, to app companies, and to companies in Silicon Valley and ISPs, you won't be on the menu anymore. Uh, this two-year detour is over, and we don't need the FCC as a Sony board for the internet. So I commend them, and, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion. All right. Is my mic working? Yeah. Yeah? Cool. All right. So. Yeah, Tom Struble here at the Institute. Uh, very much enjoyed all those speeches. Uh, they were entertaining and informative. But this panel discussion will hopefully get deeper into the weeds on some of these telecom policy issues. Uh, in terms of my upfront framing for my remarks, uh, I guess I am mean, honestly very excited about the end of the term, the end of freedom. Uh, I don't know if it's as monumental or revolutionary as it's being discussed in at least social media and some of the news uh, to describe it. And, plain terms, we're switching from ex ante rules-based approach to an ex post case-by-case -case approach based on standards. Uh, that's it. But I am still very excited about it. Uh, and I guess to follow up on Rosalind's initial framing, talking about net neutrality versus internet freedom, uh, I think they're both you know, phrases trying to get at the same thing. Consumers don't want to be harmed by unfair, deceptive business conduct. Uh, I personally prefer the internet freedom framing to the neutrality framing because I think the neutrality is framed as sort of a negative freedom on its, it is basically restricts the practices of broadband providers, says what they cannot do, whereas internet freedom is framed as a positive freedom from the perspective of users, saying that users have the right to use the content and applications, services, and devices of their choosing, and necessarily any business practices that interfere with that are illegal. But I certainly prefer to think of it from my own perspective as a consumer, uh, based on what I want to do, I should be allowed to on the internet. So it's my take, but let's get into it. Okay, I was hoping, Rosalyn, you've written some wonderful stuff about net neutrality's impacts in other countries, and I just wondered if you could share a little bit about what we might learn 
with the longer term effects of if we were leaving these regulations in place, what we might see more and more of. Well, thanks for that. My, my hope is that other countries will certainly be inspired by the leadership taken by our current FCC. But what I think is interesting, you know, I, um, you can find my research at American Enterprise Institute, uh, is that in any case where a country has brought in a hard rule, whether through regulation or legislation, things have not gotten better afterwards. I mean, in the sense that the policymakers actually codify in their rules, we're making this to guarantee innovation. For example, the European Union said that. Five years later, after, especially in countries in Latin America, for example, there are not more apps created in those particular countries. They have fewer apps created in those particular countries. So there's no empirical proof that the hardline approach that the FCC took in 2015 works. We do have a number of examples where self-regulation, transparency, codes of conduct, actually encourage the ecosystem to produce innovation, and encourage experimental uh, consumer beneficial practices. That was the case in the Nordic countries. Uh, in Denmark, for example, started self-regulatory regime in 2011, extremely uh, successful there. Switzerland today, they use a uh, code of conduct with an arbitration board. So it's interesting, these are the countries that the left has praised for low prices, uh, competition, uh, high-speed broadband networks, but the, those were countries that adopted uh, very uh, soft rules or light-touch approach. What's also interesting is China has no net neutrality rules at all, but is an extremely successful, productive country in terms of internet innovation. As of May of 2016, we download more total apps from China than we do with the United States. So there's really no connection between uh, this assertion that the FCC tried to put in 2015 a virtuous circle that is proven anywhere. And certainly, what we, we heard from Chairman Pai, uh, and you can read the order yourself, all of the detriment that has resulted from Title II. And I think notably, we have a, a petitioner in front of the Supreme Court, Dan Berninger, co-inventor of Voice Over IP, um, his app is banned. He, his app cannot work because of the, uh, the, the, current, the, the current order that's in place. So lots of cases of deterrence in innovation and deployment. Um, no instances of things getting better from this heavy-handed approach. Brent, I was hoping you could talk a little bit, maybe more the long-term record the FCC has with uh, pretty historically heavy-handed regulation of industries and what the innovation in some of those places has looked like. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, in short, it, it wasn't working well. I mean, Title II regulation regulation particular dates back, of course, to the 1934 Communications Act. It was, it was designed for the AT&T long-distance monopoly and, and local uh, telephone monopolies, and that was, that was uh, a pretty stable market, but not a very innovative one for, for 50 years or so. And for the last 40 years, I mean, almost, almost without exception, has been getting rid of Title II regulations, almost without exception. And 2015 was, was a big reversal on that, and, um, you know, and just you know, a few case studies, you know, this, this removed competitive pressures. It, you had cellular phones in, in the 1940s. This was, they didn't become popular until the 80s, in you know, large part because AT&T wasn't particularly interested, the FCC wasn't particularly interested. And that's, that's a result of Title II and having, having this monopoly. <coughs> and, and the other thing I'll say, Title II might arguably make sense for the phone network. And, and, and telecommunications networks at the time were basically mono service. I mean, voice telephony was the service. Arguably, Title II and that rigid framework makes sense for one service, but the internet is poly service. And Christopher Yu talks about the, uh, network diversity, the need for broadband to carry hundreds, thousands of different services and applications needing different types of priority and network management. And Title II just is, is not up to the task of that. It might have been for the telephone voice telephony market. It's not for the, the poly service internet market that we have today. Well, I want to, you could just pick back on that, Brent, because Title II was even harmful in, the, in, the tele, in, in telecommunications. It was so bad that the Department of Justice had to break up the collusion between the FCC and Mont Bell. And people were being overcharged. So why is somehow putting that same framework on the internet is a good idea? It, it boggles the mind. Yeah, I mean, that, that's right. I mean, regulatory capture was so serious for Title II that, that an alternate agency had to break up. Right. I should like to follow up on the historical framing. Uh, I mean, you did a great job describing Title II's history of the 20th century, 
arguably worked okay, not that great, we eventually switched away from it, but in terms of more recent history, uh, the last time Congress updated the Communications Act was in 1996, so 20 years ago, the Telecom Act, and since then we've sort of had a table of two decades. Uh, for the first decade, the FCC hewed close to Congress's intent, uh, as Chief quoted earlier from Section 230, uh, the vital competitive free market unfettered by federal state regulation. Uh, to the FCC hewed to that mission uh, up through 2007, first by 2002, refusing to put the morass of Title II regs on the cable pipe, despite some pressure to do that. It was upheld in 2005, 6 to 3 in the Brand X case. In 2007, the FCC harmonized broadband regulation by taking Title II away from telco with fiber based broadband. And that was the same year, 2007, the FCC came, or FTC came out with its brilliant 107-page report on broadband competition and net neutrality. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. Uh, 2007 was also the year that, uh, despite being five months after the FTC's net neutrality report came out, several progressive groups filed a complaint with the FCC against uh, the Comcast BitTorrent throttling issue. And the FCC, on a party line vote the following year, took up the case and set us down the path we've been on for the last decade, which has been, I think, a big deviation from Congress' intent the last time they spoke to the issue. And what the FCC is doing now and returning to the Title I framework, I think, is perfectly in keeping with Congress' intent. And I'm glad that we seem to be riding the ship, going back on the path that Congress set for us for so long, you know, at least until they speak to the issue again. Okay, and I want to give everyone, if you don't mind, an opportunity to kind of highlight for us what you think is the most harmful myth as you read the coverage, you hear people talk about it. What do you think has been particularly disturbing to people or convincing that is not true? We'll give you a chance to kind of clear that up and, and give us some good information on that. So I think, you know, you can go, even though 91% of Americans can enjoy a broadband connection of 25 megabits per or higher, there's still, let's say, 9% of America, which is quite a few of many people who are not happy with the uh, with the number or the types of broadband connections they have. That is a legitimate complaint. The but the notion that somehow Title II would would fix that is absolutely wrong. The idea of Title II is to create a monoculture of networks. It's to only have one provider, essentially a, a government provider, which is overseen by the FCC and a single price to connect to it. That is completely the opposite idea. When people say they want more competition, they mean they want more choices, they want more technologies. So internet freedom is really at the very heart of allowing this competition at scale. The freedom to innovate, the freedom to, the freedom to serve consumers, the freedom of people to decide whether or not they want to pay for something. Certainly people uh, you know, complain today that broadband may be too high. I, mean, I almost think it's, the value is much greater than the price. But on the other hand, there's no reason why broadband couldn't be free. Uh, and, and, and many uh, companies have experimented with that. But what this, uh, what uh, net neutrality is holding back is the all of the types of multi-sided market arrangements that can evolve, where different companies who want to, who want to be able to offer, uh, to, to sponsor content or offer content for free want to be able to do that. So, uh, on those kinds of, you know, I think that the people who are complaining the most may have the most to do. I'd say the, the most pernicious myth is this idea that internet service providers are pitching to block content and, and, and curate the internet. And as, as uh, and there are, there, there's a small market segment that wants that. I mean, you think of children or families who don't want pornography and that sort of thing. There, there is a small market for that. But, and, and that's why, I mean, this gets to the myth. The Obama, the, the 2015 rules uh, that the Obama FCC has, the order expressly says that curated internet is, is acceptable. And this came out in the DC Circuit case. The, the, the attorney for the FCC at the time said, not only is filtered internet allowed, it's, uh, it drops out Title II. And so you have this asymmetry where filtered internet drops out Title II, conventional internet that everyone wants is is regulated heavily, and that's, uh, as the current proposal says, this is one reason to, to repeal the rules, because this is not a state equilibrium. I mean, if, if regulations do get much heavier on the Title II side, you're tempting companies to filter the internet and escape to the less regulated side, and all, all kinds of regulatory arbitrage that comes with that. So, yeah, this idea that companies are itching to curate is just not true. They're allowed to do it today, 
and they don't. There's just not that much demand for it outside of a few market segments. But and let me add on that. What I think is so interesting, we talk about Rich for You and his network diversity concept, that in many cases, financial, FinTech, for example, financial industries, they are exiting innovation on the public internet. They cannot get the quality of service they need under a sort of a net neutrality framework. They need to be able to offer things with a, 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 a data guarantee, a delivery guarantee, what have you, or experiment with less than best efforts or greater than best efforts. So where we see now, innovations actually wants to go into blockchain, wants to go into the areas that are unregulated whatsoever and escape any kind of uh, regulatory oversight. So you know that's something I think we need to balance if we really want to have the next level. I mean, some people think the internet's the end of innovation. I, personally, I hope not. I mean, we want to see more things evolve more cool. Yes, I absolutely agree with all of that. Uh, in terms of, I guess, myth busting, the, you know, the myth that this is killing net neutrality and the end of the internet, it was sufficiently debunked by the speeches, so I won't get into that more. But uh, I guess one myth I have heard that has a kernel of truth to it, but is in fact misleading, that I would like to debunk, uh, is so I talked earlier about the, you know, switching from an ex-ante rules-based approach to an ex-post standards-based approach, which I think makes perfect sense here. Uh, doing that, some commenters have claimed, is going to lead to more consumer harm than a rules-based approach. Uh, that is potentially true, uh, because of the nature of you know, case-by-case -case enforcement. You have to wait for actual or likely harm until you can enforce something, but Allow, you know, the fact that some more consumer harm may arise than under a rules-based approach is not the end of the discussion. You have to realize that you'll also likely mm -hmm. see more benefits from an ex-post case-by-case approach than you would under an ex-ante rules-based approach. And as an administrative agency, when you're making policy, you have to weigh the costs and benefits of any proposal before putting it into law. And the FCC and FTC, I think, have reasonably decided that an ex-post approach may result in more harm than an ex ante prophylactic approach, but also significantly more benefits. And the benefits from an ex post approach would outweigh the harms that would come with it. So on net, I think it is still a superior approach to broadband regulation. So just one item I see a lot of, I think that there's a lot of mix up in terms of people being worried about this change with just straight fraud. So I thought you could, if anyone has a comment about sort of the FTC stepping in, it seems like the real dangers are nothing new. You know, you make a contract and someone doesn't do what they said they were going to do, you've got a fraud case. But does anyone have any thoughts on maybe that being better suited for the FTC than this? Yeah, I'll quickly jump on that because another, I can say it's a myth uh, entirely, but it's thrown around a lot, is that the FCC's approach was going to rely on voluntary commitments by ISPs. That is not the case. No one is trusting these guys to do the right thing and no one's going to have any oversight. The FCC is specifically requiring them to make transparent disclosures about their business practices. There's no relying on trust or anything. They're required by law to make these disclosures. And if they're deceptive or inaccurate in some way, that's illegal and they can be sued. So, well, I'm going to, um, Tom and I, we have a paper uh, on the FTC looking at these questions, and it's important to know that half of the budget of the FTC goes to consumer protection, and that is in their DNA, in a way that is not in the mission or the DNA of the FCC. And the FTC actually works with the state AGs. So they are, their Section 5 unfair, fraudulent, deceptive practices, that's exactly what they're looking for. And you can map every single net neutrality complaint to a type of an antitrust violation. They're all there. They've already been described. And as Chairman Allhausen said, there have been 500 enforcements over recent years uh, related to that. And in fact, the history of enforcements is a de facto kind of regulation because people understand, <laughs> companies understand, you know, these are the these are the, the, the invisible lines, if you will, but they are lines nonetheless. Uh, the other thing I think to say, uh, my my personal take with the current the FCC order to be voted on was a RIFO, Restoring Internet Freedom Order. I find the transparency protections very tough, particularly when I look at other countries. Um, that I think that they're they may they're maybe too tough in a sense. Uh, we we can see that companies have spent up, upwards of 600 hours just you know complying <coughs> with what the FCC requires. They have to disclose all these kinds of practices. So you know the FCC itself is defining what's a concern, but you also have to wonder well you know do consumers desire that level of transparency? 
Um, but we can certainly see other countries that have had success with this sort of um, disclosure and transparency, certainly in the case of Sweden. Um, they felt that that was superior than other, uh, than other regimes. So, um, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, so this notion that nothing's there, it's actually, it's not the case at all. I mean, there are quite strong rules on the books. And this whole debate, I'm sure we've, I mean, we've talked about it a little bit, uh, but it's received just not only an abnormal amount of attention, but attention from maybe some unexpected places. I mean, we know and love this issue, obviously, but it's interesting to think of late night talk show hosts and actresses who have decided that they need to weigh in on this. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about why this has become such a hot button issue, all the way from famous people tweeting to the enormous amount of comments that I'm not going to say have been written, but maybe have been generated to the FCC. And just why this is of such interest um, to a larger group than maybe you would expect for a rather technical policy issue. If you had any thoughts? Sure. Uh, so, I guess I think the reason that you have so much attention around this issue and millions of people, like 4 million in 2014, 22 million this year, all weighing in at the FCC in what should be, you know, a, I guess, nerdy inside, subway <laughs> telecom dispute, um, has turned into a really popular hot button issue, yeah, getting into all sorts of social circles. Uh, I think is a result of a failure in Congress to pass legislation to clarify how it wants broadband to be regulated. We haven't done any legislation to that effect in over 20 years, and I think it is well overdue at this point. Uh, I have an open mind about what you know, legislation should look like going forward. I very much want to see how the FTC can do, given a fair chance at you know, protecting net neutrality and freedom, you know, regulating broadband. I think they are up to the task, but it remains to be seen, but I think that is the main issue. We have so many people weighing in, but weighing in at the wrong places. The FCC is not a democratic institution. It's an administrative agency. It's a technocracy. If we actually have enough people interested in broadband regulation, go to your elected representatives and encourage them to pass legislation. So speaking, keep, keeping things kind of looking ahead, can I ask you substantively what comes next? So the vote is December 14th, and then what happens in terms of? Lawsuits filed, chaos, the end of the world, everything's better. And then, you know, feel free to have that be substantive and also your personal predictions would be fascinating, I think. Yeah, I mean, so the, the vote would be in December, obviously, and then uh, takes a few months, maybe a year, for it to be the Federal Register and enforceable. And certainly there'll be lawsuits over this. Um, I. So courts are generally def deferential to agencies on these decisions, particularly in this case where the core issue is, can internet access be an information service? And the Supreme Court has already said in 2002 that's a reasonable interpretation of the law. I would, I would be stunned if, if the court, uh, certainly on, on the core issue, uh, reversed what, what the FCC is preparing to do. Um, I mean, yeah, the courts are deferential to a fault, and, and I expect here Particularly after 2015, the 2016 uh, litigation, where the court began, so it's very deferential. And you know, I'll say, I mean, getting back to Section 230, which has come up several times, that there was this great, great bipartisan law that the internet, and specifically internet access services, should be unfettered. It's a quote, unfettered from federal and state regulation. And if if that precludes any regulation, that would seem to preclude Title II regulation, which is the most uh, rigorous, the most stringent regulatory tool the FCC has available. And so the court even deferred on, on that issue when when Congress is not silent about the internet. And, and by the way, section two, I mean, so a reason Congress got involved and said don't don't touch the internet is because in uh, in the 1980s, Congress, it took them 20 years to address cable. Cable TV was not addressed in the 1930s, but the FCC said we have authority to regulate cable TV in the 60s and prevented cable uh, for several years it took 20 years for Congress to respond and say, undo a lot of the, the law that built up for 20 years. And so in the 90s, Congress had this new technology, the internet, and said, we're not letting this cable thing happen again. FCC, it should be unfettered for federal state regulation. Um, so all that to say, I, I would be stunned if, uh, if this were overturned, um, and uh, just because, of course, deferential. So 
You know, what's interesting, if you look at Chairman High's agenda and, and the upcoming meeting on the 14th, you know, the Restoring Internet Freedom is maybe just one of seven items. And this issue is kind of the sideshow for what's really important to him and the FCC, which is closing the digital divide. And I think something, Brent, you know, you're serving on the uh, Broadband Employment Advisory Committee. The really the important work that has to go on is removing the state and local barriers to uh, network deployment. I mean, if we ultimately want to see this change, we have to be able to get networks at scale, like small cells, um, towers, being able to get a better job at rights of way, um, reforming spectrum. So, you know, I, I don't, so we'll go look to the 14th, <coughs> the 3-2 vote. The next break point would probably be in February, where the uh, Supreme Court will take up the seven petitions, whether or not they will receive cert. Uh, that would certainly be interesting to see if the Supreme Court would weigh in. But you see some slight movements in Congress that some congressional Democrats are sort of finally saying, well, okay, maybe we need to do something after they've had years of, um, you know, the Republicans have been there trying to, to resolve this, this challenge. But I think there is an important issue here at the table, which is the First Amendment. And I might take this back to Brent because he's written so well on this. But there is a notion here that if we are requiring, if the government is regulating networks, it's forcing how data is to be treated, it is requiring that all data is treated the same, it is a violation of the First Amendment, requiring people to pay the same, not being able to express their preferences. So um, there is a First Amendment challenge in front of the court now. Um, we may, uh, you know, sooner rather than later, we might hear something. Sure, yeah. Uh, as Robson mentioned, there, yeah, there's still several petitions for cert pending at the, at the Supreme Court, reviewing the 2015 order. Uh, it's still possible the Supreme Court could grant cert and rehear those cases or remand them to the DC Circuit to be heard simultaneously with the challenge to the forthcoming restoring the Supreme Court. I won't get into complex litigation, it's really confusing, but in terms of the instant proceeding, it's going to pass by the 3 to 2. It's going to be challenged in the DC Circuit. My favorite before Judge Tatel. He's heard the previous three neutrality cases and most FCC cases that all end up in the DC Circuit. Uh, and based on the current state of administrative law, the FCC will win because, for better or worse, administrative agencies get a lot of deference in interpreting the law and even more in interpreting the facts. So, uh, and I guess myself and several other scholars have long lamented this. I guess degree of deference given to agencies. I think it's unconstitutional and violates Article One. But so I guess in that respect, I think it'll be a mixed bag for me personally uh, at the DC Circuit. If it's upheld, I'll be happy about that result. But still, lament the state of administrative deference. If there is a change in administrative law and they strike down this order, I will be happy about that. But disappointed about the result. But yeah. That's right. Well, with Tom's mixed bag, we're going to take some questions if there are any. I'm going to relinquish my microphone. Hi, John McEwen with Cause of Action. Um, we're, I applaud this rule. It looks like uh, getting rid of net neutrality is great. Um, but I do have a little, a little bit of a question about the FTC. The reason that the FTC would be able to regulate is they'll no, no longer be common carriers, and the FTC is prohibited from um, from regulating common carriers, as I understand it. We we um, we represent clients who've been sued by the FTC, and I'm uh, a lot less confident that the uh, post hoc uh, enforcement actions help companies figure out what's unfair and what's not unfair. I'd like to talk a little bit about this. There, there seems to be, uh, it seems you're, you're, you're throwing out one wolf and bringing in another wolf uh, because I don't know that the FTC is really great at doing this uh, from what I've seen. It, it strikes me that oftentimes, it's, at least what we've seen, is it brings cases when there's no damages. One of the big issues right now in cybersecurity is whether or not the FTC can bring a breach when no one's been harmed and the company fixed the problem and suddenly they're, they're paying millions and millions of dollars in legal fees when, they're, the, when the FTC won't say that, hey, no damages, we won't sue you. Um, the court's hidden a little bit, but I, I'd like to hear about this because I think yeah, you're being a little polygamous. Yeah, about please. It, just the yes, uh, Ross and I have recently uh, in FedSoc that I encourage you all to bring against these issues. Uh, but 
yes, raised some important points on FTC process. I, I would say that agency is perfect. I have critiques of how they adjudicate cases or fail to adjudicate cases more often and just settle things by consent decrees. I actually have a white paper coming out on FTC reform uh, maybe next week. But uh, in terms of enforcement under the framework going forward, the fact that the FCC is requiring transparent disclosures means that enforcement could be very quick and expeditious at the FTC because if they're in a spaghetti case under the deception authority, the consumer protection side of things, they don't have to show any harm, actual or likely. It's enough to show that you were deceptive and the thing that you were deceptive about was important, it's not just some minor rate in your title. Uh, so I think that is how it will work. But we need certainty for industry and for consumers, and we start with broad standards like no unfair or deceptive acts or practices or no unreasonable discrimination. You need to get certainty some way. One way to do that is come out with rules that have more specific requirements of what it means to you know, be unfair or deceptive. The other way is through a common law you know, case by case approach, where over time, through application of the law to the facts in various cases, you get a general understanding of how the law works. You know, it's the common law evolutionary type system that we in England and other I guess, former colonies still follow. So I think going forward, the FTC needs to litigate more and provide more <coughs> formal adjudication and guidance on how the Section 5 authority does apply and not just rely on consent decrees. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, I'll say one thing on that. I think there's a big difference in legal regimes that generally there's a burden on the FTC to show harm or exception. And in the FTC, Context generally you have to show non harm or public interest, affirmative public interest benefits, and that's, that's that's a big change. Also, substantively, the internet conduct standard, no one knows what that means. As Chairman Wheeler said, said, frankly, no one knows what it means. I'll give the quick example of a T Mobile zero rating experiment that they did a couple of years ago. So, Chairman Wheeler was, was asked about this, and I'm off the top kind of said it's, it's innovative and, and pro competitive for. A small carrier like T-Mobile to do this, a third or fourth carrier. Um, ask other Title II supporters. Uh, Susan Crawford comes to mind. She called it a human rights infringement and said it's dangerous and should be ended immediately. And so, I mean, it, it's hard to imagine the FTC doing worse, worse than that. As far as you know, you can agree on the words and the law, it still reaches very different. I mean, how, how is somebody supposed to predict? Is it competitive or, or is it human rights infringement? When, when you have that variance. Uh, we need to get rid of the internet policy. So let me, I want to point out one thing I think the F FTC has done under Chair Russell Housing, which was really, it, it's, it's much needed. It's really launched a campaign for economic liberty, which has been looking at occupational licensing. And this is really an area where government regulations have been harming entrepreneurs, have been harming people, and has gone around the country to find, uh, you know, from everything, hair braiders, uh, uh, um, flower arrangers, a whole range of important ways for people to start their own business. They have been deterred because of state and local regulations. So she has shined a light on this, and I think that's been extremely, that would be a very good use of the FTC, is showing how governments themselves create barriers to entry. Um, but to this gentleman, I absolutely want to take your point. Even with the FTC, we don't have a free market for broadband. And you, know, you can go to um, American Enterprise Institute, Gus Hurwitz, he has documented the, uh, the issues of a company called LabMD under the FTC. So, you, so, you, so I know this gentleman, like Darty, you know, incredible person, brilliant idea. You know, his company went out of business. He had cancer diagnostics, something that's an extremely valuable technology that is helpful for human beings. You know, extremely innovative, and you know, this desire from po politicians who want to see their regulatory agencies as a way to deliver favorable headlines for them. I mean, we see this in mergers, we've seen it FTC and FCC, that the enforcements are driven at, with a political motivation. And, and you can also see it, if you see what, are, what accounts for net neutrality complaints at the FCC, they have never been instances of blocking or throttling, but people say, I didn't get the speed, I was promised, you know, these kind of sort of boring things that nobody wants to talk about. But the two leading cases of, uh, that were brought, who actually started at the FTC, this uh, charge against AT&T mobility, um, you know, both agencies brought the same case against the same company. One called it transparency, the other one called it neutrality. So there's a, a tremendous waste in the duplication of, of, of these rules. And it was, you know, there is a political element to it. So I want to take your point. You're absolutely right about that. Um, 
And I think the work that myself, my colleagues are trying to do is when we look at what a free market means, it also is about reducing the government distortion that deters the ability of entrepreneurs and innovation. And that's also very real. So to the extent that we can go back to what Congress intended for these agencies to do, that's a good thing. Or we can clarify it, or we can call it out, reduce the political um, rewards for doing you know, these kinds of politically motivated enforcements. Um, you know, that would be a good thing. Okay, I think we're at 3 o'clock. That's all the time we have. But I want to thank everyone for being on the panel and everyone for coming. Thank you so much.